The Museum of Contemporary Art Denver presents Practicing Citizenship, a conversation series featuring artists, activists, and experts exploring civic engagement. Tonight, we bring you Alexandra Bell and Lee Rayford on implicit racial bias in the media. And now, here's Sarah Bai. MCA Denver's Director of Program. Hello everyone, I am Sarah Bai. I'm the Director of Programming at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Denver, and this is Practicing Citizenship, a program series MCA Denver is producing in conjunction with the exhibition Citizenship, a Practice of Society. We come to you live every Wednesday night throughout the run of the exhibition. And tonight we are presenting a conversation on implicit racial bias in the media. And I am joined by artist Alexandra Bell and Professor Lee Rayford. I'll introduce Alexandra and Lee in a moment. But first, this conversation is a continuation of an artwork created by Alexandra called Counter Narratives, which examines implicit racial bias in the New York Times, in particular demonstrating how layout, syntax, and photographs inform the understanding of current events, sometimes without our awareness. Alexandra's work is on view as a part of the Citizenship Exhibition, which I am delighted to say will safely reopen to the public this Friday, following an amendment to Governor Polis's public health order. So first, I wanna thank you for tuning in today to hear from the artists whose work we are proud to display and for your continued and ongoing support of the museum. If you have the means, please consider donating to support MCA Denver. We suggest a donation of $10, which is what we would normally charge for tickets, but of course, any amount helps. Thank you so much for your support. As questions come up tonight throughout the talk, you can type them in the chat or save them for the end. To ask a question, however, you have to log on to YouTube, which is a little easier on a laptop or a tablet than it is on your TV. So go ahead and do that if you'd like to be part of the conversation. As always, we wanna hear your voice. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Alexandra and Lee. Alexandra is a multidisciplinary artist who investigates the complex narratives Informational, of informational consumption and perception. Using various media, she deconstructs language and imagery to explore the tension between marginal experiences and dominant histories. Her work has been exhibited at Jeffrey Deitch Gallery, Charlie James Gallery, MoMA PS1, and the Whitney Museum of American Art. She's a 2020 awardee. Bell holds a BA in Interdisciplinary Studies in the Humanities from the University of Chicago and an MS in Journalism from Columbia University. Lee Rayford is an Associate Professor of African American Studies at UC Berkeley, where she teaches, researches, and writes about race, gender, justice, and visuality. She's the author of Imprisoned in a Luminous Glare, Photography in the African American Freedom Struggle, co-editor of Migrating the Black Body, Visual Culture and the African, African Diaspora, and the co-editor of the Civil Rights Movement in American Memory. She is currently working on a book called When Home is a Photograph, Blackness and Belonging in the World. Please welcome Alexandra and Lee. Are we here? You <laughs> were here. <laughs> Hi everyone. Hi Alex. Hi everyone. Um, well, thank you. Let me just thank Sarah for uh, inviting us in that introduction. Um, and thank you to everyone who's joining us. I just also want to say a special hello and thank you to my family in Denver and um, my family in Atlanta and a happy birthday to my my mom. Um, and But I'm really thrilled to be here with Alex Bell, one of my favorite interlocutors. Um, and I'm really looking forward to our conversation this evening. Um, Alex, do you want to say anything before I ask ask some questions? No, I mean I'm happy to be here. I, this is I've been sucked into my second video talk of this pandemic, so <laughs> it's an adjustment for me. But it, I'm ready. Okay, great. Well, and I should let everyone know that um, this is a new platform for, well, Alex is new new to, to video um, conversations uh, generally, but um, for, for most of us who are used to using Zoom, we're using StreamYard today, and this is a little new, so I um, also just want to ask everyone to bear with us while we're, you know, if we, we work out some, so we're working out some technical hiccups um, or glitches. Um, but the first place I want to start is just 
um, by asking you, Alex, to talk a little bit about the work that's in the show, um, the triptych, and I'm gonna pull up um, uh, pull up a, a version, an iteration of the work. Let's mm -hmm. see, there we go. Um, yeah. Wait, can you not see it? No, I can see it, it's an installation um, at okay. on the PS1. Okay, great. Um, and if you could just talk a little bit about your work in the show, the triptych, um, and then um, we can talk a little bit more as well about your process and, and your practice more broadly. Sure. Um, so this is technically the second work in the series. So the work began really with the redacted page, which is the center panel there and the third panel. Um, I think what's probably a better place to start now that people have some mm -hmm. What the work is is the um, news articles that motivated um, the series and the approach to the work. So if maybe we could go back. Yeah, let's see if I can get there. Um, it's a Life magazine. Okay. Told you this was going to be a little. Oops. Okay. Okay. Um, oops. And so we're going. We're going a little backwards to Life magazine. You said. Okay. And then we'll, I'll, I'll tell you when to move forward. This one, yeah? Perfect. Okay, okay great. Hopefully everyone can see that. Um, so I didn't, I don't think this was in my bio included here, but I am a journalism graduate. Um, and so part of the training that I received was really about um, looking and thinking through um, newspapers. Um, it was a pretty limited study in some ways. We had to read three newspapers a day and consider the ways that different publications framed stories. Um, and it was New York Times, Daily News, and the Wall Street Journal. And uh, it, was, it was so we could get a sense of how um, New York Times, which just seen as the more liberal of the, of the three, um, framed the story. The Wall Street Journal, which of course is um, less liberal, <laughs> uh, more conservative, um, numbers-based paper, and then Daily News, which is kind of like a quickie, quickie newspaper. Um, I kind of quickly started to realize that there was something a little off that I couldn't quite put my finger on. And years later, I started to revisit a number of articles in other papers to kind of center my thinking. Uh, this particular slide that you all are looking from is a 1941 Life magazine. Um, there are several annotations on it. It's um, post Pearl Harbor. It's um, instructing people how to tell the difference between a Chinese person and a Japanese person. Mm -hmm. Next slide. Next supposedly, slide. right? Mm -hmm. Supposedly. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, supposedly, of course. Um, the 1994, um, I, of course, most of us will remember this. Um, mm -hmm. It's a photo uh, manipulation of O.J. Simpson's, O.J. Simpson's mug, mugshot in 1994. If you see on one side, there's a Time magazine where they deliberately darkened the photo. Um, this is something that we refer to in journalism school quite often as kind of a no-no in photo editing. Um, next, next slide. Okay. Um, I'm 2011. This is a this is another photo manipulation, although you can't see it just yet. Um, if you look at the in the front, um, you see then Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, and in the back, far back, there's a woman with dark hair. Um, Audra Thomason, who is the director of counterterrorism. This is a situation room photo. This is the image that they snapped as they were um, killing Osama, Osama bin Laden. Um, we go to the next photo. This mm -hmm. is um, this appeared in 2011 in an ultra orthodox Brooklyn newspaper. Uh, they don't run images of women, so they Photoshop them out. <laughs> um, <laughs> 2019, there's one more. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and this is a 2019 daily newspaper. If you look at the top portion of, you have, they want new life in America, you see a, a large group of individuals um, heading towards a fence, jumping over that gate, and the bottom you see destroy America, right? And so the juxtaposition of that suggests that this group of people is coming here to destroy America. Obviously, if you read, read it closely, you, you realize those individuals aren't at the American border, they're at the Mexican border, but the, the juxtaposition of those two things implies something else. Um, 
So basically what I've shown in some ways is what the counter narrative series is rooted in, right? It pulls mm -hmm. um, from marginalia and markings, um, photo manipulation, image juxtaposition, right? And so these, these particular um, works get us to the crux of like how counter narrative performs. Um, if you could go, we jump forward, jump forward, jump forward to back to the, uh, the this slide, the Newsweek. Go oh, one more. Okay. Okay. So here is where um, a teenager with promise begins. Um, it's a New York Times article. Uh, it's August twenty fifth, two thousand and fourteen. It's actually the day of Michael Brown's funeral. Um, the, they ran two articles, they juxtaposed them. Um, my decision at that time was that there was a way for me to get at the, the idea that there's no objectivity. Um, mm -hmm. So one more slide forward. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the goal of it was to try to pin down kind of racist and dehumanizing frameworks, right? And to get at this idea that objectivity is, a, there's, a, there's a fallacy in that thinking that you can't take two things and look at them completely the same, that there's a power structure that's existing here. You have Michael Brown as a, as, a, as a young person, and you have Darren Wilson as an agent of the state. Um, and so I wanted to show that perspective, subjectivity, and like layout influence influences our understanding and interpretation of the news. Um, each work in the series pretty much deals with an overarching theme. This one in particular is about objectivity and power. And so that brings us to the triptych, which is a couple of slides through here. It took, it took a number of iterations to get to what the work would do, which is kind of a before and after. Mm -hmm. So this is the work that's in the show. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna toggle out so I can see you. And hopefully that'll work. Okay, there you are. Um, thank you for for sharing the kind of the, the origins of the work and the kind of in some of the development. And I think what's one of the things I think is so powerful and important about your work is that um, it's not really about kind of necessarily correction, right? Um, but really trying to get at um, sort of these deeper questions around um, the kind of fundamental structural frames, right, in which black life is presented in the new white right? and white life. White exactly. life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so maybe you could just say a little bit more about, um, you know, how you came to the, the process. Um, you said it took it took a little while to, to kind of develop the iteration. Um, you know, when did you know that the, the kind of before and after as well as the kind of the performance of um, annotation or, and redaction was, you know, was was the kind of the, the tone that you needed that you wanted to hit? Um, you know what, I approached it very much like editing a document. I was mm -hmm. trying to imagine as an artwork what it will look like to present it to the public. Right. And so first, there's a really there's an early draft of the Michael Brown work that actually I've never shown. I wish it was in here so I could show it. <laughs> um, it's, it's really bad. Um, but there's um, the, what I was trying to do is I, I'm approaching it the same way you would edit a document mm -hmm. or, or anything. Was, I went in, read it and I had a set of questions about what I was seeing. Right. And some of those are really simple. Some of those were asked about the location of the doc, uh, location of the article. Um, why the title looked a certain way. I was trying to decide if I wanted to eliminate um, Darren Wilson, if, if the goal of the work was to, to present Michael Brown in this really redemptive light, if that was the, the nature of it. And then I tried to stick as closely as I could to my journalism training. Um, and, and what that required is that I think in some ways, um, at least journalism training and my own thinking, um, about what the power difference was, right? And the fact that I recognized that Darren, the article about Officer Darren Wilson was um, lenient in comparison to um, the article about Michael Brown and the Michael Brown article, No Angel, was, was less so. And so I wanted to try to figure that out. And so there's several markings. We kind of skipped through them. You can revisit them after this. Um, 
where you see me kind of grappling with those decisions, right? So in the process notes, um, where there's a red ink, you know, Darren Wilson's crossed out. I don't know if you're trying to pull it up. I, I really am. Um, sorry guys, this program is very different from Zoom. Um, ah, okay. Okay. Um, and so let me go. This one. I think it's back one more. Okay. Okay, great. So this is technically one of like the, the first like early iterations of the, the markings. Um, I was really trying to figure out um, if I wanted to replace the image of Michael Brown, if I wanted to hide the text that was shown there. And it took me maybe nine versions of this to kind of get to the before and after image. And the first, mm -hmm. if you go one more, this is another one before I decided that maybe redaction, and, and some of that is influenced by redaction poetry um, mm -hmm. and trying to restrict the language because what I was trying to get at is that there's all this extraneous information. It's not to say that it isn't factual, um, but that it's contributing to a particular view of this narrative. And so what I wanted to do is try to strip it bare and get mm -hmm. to the heart of what happened, which is that Darren Wilson shot and killed Michael Brown and then Michael Brown died because he was shot by Darren Wilson. So go one more. Mm -hmm. So that brings us to this, which is one of the panels one of the, from the first work. And then the second panel, if you go to the next one, that one, okay. Mm -hmm. um, so th that was that was pretty much the process, which is that the decision that the, the, the work on the left hand side would be the annotations, the instructions of how to move forward. And then the one on the right would be the final, mm -hmm. um, that it should be two. And, and part of that is I wanted people to see what the times had done before first, right? And right. to be able to engage and mark on that and then move forward to what my version was. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I appreciate you not using the word correction because it's not necessarily how I like to refer to it because I'm trying to get at this idea that I'm, they're not wrong per se, right? It's very, I think it's very important for us to consider frameworks that I'm not saying that what they're doing is wrong. I'm saying that it, it's, it's biased, it's skewed, the framework the framework lends itself to a particular understanding. And then if I shift that framework through a series of redactions or markings um, or photo changes, then I can change what you may overall believe the story to be. Um, it's mm -hmm. a fascinating thing, kind of, yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, and I'm, I'm gonna sit here for a second because I think in seeing the, you know, the annotation, the annotation, right? I mean, in, in anybody who's like, had their work corrected, right? That red ink is, um, <laughs> right, is, is an alert, right? Um, but the way that it highlights, um, you know, it, it kind of calls to task, right? Mm -hmm. The kind of structures um, of, you know, of, of whiteness, right? And, and, um, and the structure and the ways in which black life and, and white life are structured. Um, but I also appreciate the redaction as well as a form both of um, a kind of um, refusal of certain kinds of language um, as a kind of, um, and also as a kind of protection, right? Um, that in the ways that we actually can't, the language that we can't see, right? And, and in some ways a kind of holding the harm that that language, holding at bay that the language, that uh, the harm that that language exacts on um, Michael Brown in particular, um, but but other other subjects. And so I was hoping, you know, we wanted to talk a little bit, um, you know, one of the, the frames, I'm actually gonna come out of this because this is, it, it is actually um, slightly disorienting to not be able to see, <laughs> see anyone. Um, let's see if I can get out. Maybe not, maybe I can't get out. Um, Maybe I am. You're out. Okay, I'm out. I'm really, you can see me. I can't see anything but the screen. Um, okay, well, I'm just going to keep going then. Um, but um, so I think what's, what's really wonderful about, important about the work, right, that rather than, um, 
the work of, of correction that it is um, about care, right? And the kind of the, the work of care that you're offering um, to, to your subjects. Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the question of care in your work. Um, you know, I'll, I'll speak specifically to it in the Michael Brown piece, because I think there was the most thought put in into that work. Um, I was trying to figure out how to name a lot of things without leaning on stereotypes. So I, I, I use the graduation image mm -hmm. as a nostalgic for nostalgia, but I get sometimes I get called out on this as um, respectability politics. Mm -hmm. um, but it's actually not the case. Um, the goal is one of the reasons that I cr actually cropped out his diploma, right? I really wanted it to be, because his diploma is in the photo. Um, I really wanted it to be something nostalgic and for you to think about, about youth. Um, and in the triptych, um, his original photo is still there. It's just a grainy picture, which was more my issue. It was the issue of quality, I think. And that they're, what I felt like they were trying to do, which explain, which also points to another problem with this kind of evenness that the Times is aiming for, is that Darren Wilson didn't really have any images available. And so the image that's available in the first picture mm -hmm. the, um, is a screenshot from a video of him receiving some kind of a, an, a, an award. And so it's super blurry, it's kind of pixelated in some ways. And I think in order to not confer any kind of favoritism, they in some ways deliberately found this grainy um, image of Michael Brown, which I thought was absolutely ridiculous. Um, mm -hmm. And so I was trying to get, maybe get away from that. Um, but I also wanted to find an image that suggested all the possibility that was still available to him. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, in the triptych where you can actually see the text and you can see them, you know, the Times talk about his possible drug use and him rapping. And I think they said he cursed. Mm -hmm. um, the graduation image has a different, you know, it operates differently, right? It's right. It, it speaks to some of like the defiance that we all feel when we're graduating, when we're like, we're grown now, but we're not really. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wanted to capture all of those things um, in the work. Um, what becomes really important in terms of care is more about the location of the work. Right? Mm -hmm. so there's a care that's taken with the creation of the work, but then there's also about where the work lives when it's put out. Because mm -hmm. the first iteration of the work, it was a, um, it was, it was a public art piece. Um, and so a friend of mine, probably, I want to say December 31st, 2016, um, we went out um, super early maybe 1 a.m., 2 a.m., and found a number of um, places and we hung the work up. Okay. Uh, and I was able to revisit some of those locations. You're, are you, can you see me now? I am trying to get back to um, the screen share. Okay. Um, so I'm working on that. You know what? I'm gonna do it. Here, I, I got it. Okay. Are you there? Are we there? Yeah. Okay, cool. All right, great. Okay, so this first one's in bed -Stuy. This is one of the earliest ones. It was in bed -Stuy. I want to say Bedford and Madison, actually. Um, the wall was, I, I learned at some point I'm not supposed to put <laughs> my work on top of graffiti. I learned the hard way, but you know, anyway. Um, so this is one of the earliest ones that was, was put up. And what I started to learn is that there was a similar care that I have for the work that the community began to have for the work as well. So if you go forward one slide, mm -hmm. you'll see what happens when the work was covered up at some point with some kind of band performance or whatever. And someone, um, not me, um, stripped, it, stripped that away. That just stripped away the, um, the sticker that was, that was put on top. Mm -hmm. um, and of course you can see the wall is at this point it's become a site for, right. for graffiti. Um, if, but if you go forward one more, once it was, I guess, ordered that the wall be painted over, um, there is a reluctance to cover his face, right? And so I saw a lot of this in, in places and in subways when someone would mark on it, someone would, you know, I've seen you know, some degrading words added and someone would come back and, and take that out. So there was a, a bit of like a public, um, interplay around it. It's yeah. really 
the care is about um, where in the aftermath, where the work lives, right? And if there's anything that I can do with that work to ensure that it remains um, cared for, even in, in my absence, other people took up that work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's interesting too, because you've also chosen a format that is um, purposely, purposely impermanent, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so there's something that is both, you know, what, what does it mean to make, um, to do a kind of memorial work that um, isn't monumental, that isn't meant to, to be around forever? You know, I didn't actually see it as a memorial work. Okay. I didn't actually, it's probably something that I learned about its function later as I saw other people interact with it, right? I was probably very hard nosed about the journalism. Like people don't get that it's about objectivity. I don't think they understand, <laughs> right? So I was really sticking to that. Um, uh -huh. And I saw these things happening. Um, I saw people, you know, doing candlelight vigils. Um, and so that is where my understanding of the work, it's a double function happened. Mm -hmm. That's so interesting that you, you know, you didn't necessarily see it as memorial because I think so, so much of the power of your work for me um, is, you know, not just the kind of the, uh, the intervention in these, con in a conversation about, um, you know, facts and truth and objectivity, um, but is also about how we, you know, how we memorialize the lives lost and how we reckon with the, the public presentation um, of black life. And I am still trying to kind of toggle out of the, um, there we, nope. Okay, I'm just gonna stop sharing because that seems to be the only way I can get back um, yeah. to, see, to seeing you. Um, but you know, and it, we've talked a lot about um, you and I have talked a lot about Christina Sharp's work in the wake, um, and I think that you know, for people who don't know that work, I think it's it's become a real touchstone for uh, many of us who are trying to understand um, how to imagine um, Black life otherwise, um, and you know. One of her sort of, sort of it's, a, it's a really rich book that just sort of keeps giving um, in its ideas. Um, but one of the the kind of key points, right, is that you know what does it mean to live in the aftermath of slavery, of colonialism, of um, you know of the kinds of uh, of anti blackness, right, which also means um, not just to live in its aftermath, but to live within it, right, in the in the the constant presence of it. Um, and Sharp offers us the concept of wake work to do the work that means defending the dead, keeping vigilance. Um, and for for Sharp, it's very much that 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 wake work really is a kind of um, it's a cultural work, right? It's the work of the artist um, in particular um, to imagine new forms. Yeah. Um, you know, and I think it's it's been a really interesting, a really important way of thinking about how we engage memory, how we collaborate with history, um, how we intervene in um, the kinds of structures that have, um, you know, that you know that we have inherited, right, and that frame black possibility, um, and also kind of white possibility, right white dominance. Um, and I think, you know, one of the things that sort of keeps coming up around that, like, is sort of thinking about, I mean, you know, how your work um, is, to me, is part of this chorus um, of contemporary work that is, that is engaged in a practice of wake work. Um, and I know we, and I guess I can pull up some slides a little bit more, but I mean, how is that, um, uh, the, the sort of a practice of wake work sort of continued in your in your ongoing you know, my own work I think mm -hmm. is that you know insisting life into the now I'm try I was hoping we would be able to pull this pull this up um, pull up other work do you want to go to try hmm? 
Do, do you want to give, give it a try to pull it up? Green stuff on my end. Um, okay. But I think, I mean, I think you actually just pretty, you put it pretty plainly, right? I, the Michael Brown work is wake work. I think that our argument is if the other work that I've done is qualifies as wake work, which I think is something maybe you can. Well, you can, I don't want to, you know, I, I don't want to be the wake work police. <laughs> you know, and like that's wake work and that isn't. No. Um, but I, you know, I think there is something to be said about, you know, um, when you when you have taken up these, you know, specific questions around um, black death, you know, what are the what are the questions you ask yourself, um, and how you know how has that um, evolved from you from a kind of you know the position of the journalist. Um, to somebody who is now, you know, um, thinking about different kinds of context for your work, right? He's thinking about what it means for your work to be in the gallery or in the museum space. Yeah. I mean, I think it's an interesting question for me to grapple with because to be honest, Michael Brown's the only person that I'm dealing with in my work who's deceased. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not a recurring thing for me, right? Mm -hmm. um, but I think my understanding of wake work um, maybe crystallized when the work received some damage and mm -hmm. there was a lot of care given to making sure that it stayed a particular way. There was this insisting of a certain kind of um, function for people that it had to live in the world a certain way, unmarked, unharmed, um, tended to in a particular way. And so that's my understanding of it in that sense. But um, the other work in the series doesn't deal directly with Black death. Um, mm -hmm. I think this was, a, you know, if somebody was trying to figure out what happens in journalism, it becomes problematic about um, how mainstream media, and I say mainstream corporate white media, um, deals with Black life and Black death. Mm -hmm. uh, this was an easy one for me to figure out. Once I got in my head what I wanted to do, um, with counter narratives, I, I immediately knew which one. Mm -hmm. um, but I will say that part of the motivation for the series came out of witnessing a lot of black death in the news and mm -hmm. feeling like there was something absent from the way the stories were being reported, right? And so, you know, I tell the story of being with my friends and it's 2016 and you have Philando Castile and then you have, and someone else dies the day before, day after mm -hmm. um, Sterling. Um, and looking at the way that that was reported and the fact that we can just kind of tune into black death whenever we want to right it's like at the at, you know we can click in um and being really concerned with some of the portrayals and wondering if the framework of the stories you know some people are like oh if we see more dead video more videos of dead black people then maybe that'll like change our thinking which i don't believe at all mm -hmm. but i think it was motivated for, by the idea that maybe if the presentation of the story um it lives a certain way maybe there's something else to glean from that, um, mm -hmm. which I also don't know if that pushes pushes us in the right direction. Um, I think that it, what I've witnessed the work do is it, um, it affirms a lot of thinking that Black folk mm -hmm. already have about how news media functions, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of an impact on kind of the white psyche, that seems to be impossible to penetrate in any kind of meaningful way. Um, I think what happens with the work is that it's seen as nice, right? There's this, I grapple a lot with how white people engage with counter narratives because they like that I'm able to crystallize something about racism in the news media and they don't feel implicated, right? And mm. so there's something about that to me that's like a little gross. Like, are you looking for work that doesn't force you to feel harm or force you to contend with your stance in the world? And so it performs a number of things, but it doesn't, it doesn't hit um, certain communities in the same way. Um, but yeah, I get I get notes all the time where people are very pleased with the fact that they feel like it's not harsh. Hmm. There's a lot of investment in that. It's 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 a nice pat on the head. So I I'm, I'm annoyed by that in a way, but there's a there's a reliance on a particular kind of um, the way you talk about racism. Um, I think. Wow. But I think that that deals a lot with how whiteness is seen as kind of inherently good and, and kind of individual, right? White mm -hmm, people mm -hmm. one another as groups. So when they see something in the news, they're like, 
or they think about, oh, I have this kind of privilege in this very kind of abstract way, right? And so they don't think that um, the same way this portrayal of Michael Brown may actually impede progress for young black boys or, mm -hmm. um, or actually direct or instruct us to view um, ourselves or other black people negatively. Um, mm -hmm. They don't actually think that like, hey, maybe I can get this job because I'm never in the news. We're, whiteness isn't this mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I don't know. The other works deal, the other as the series progressed, um, and this was quite by accident, right? Um, mm -hmm. The series became a lot more about whiteness. Right, I was gonna ask you about that. I mean, there, you've got a number of works that are explicitly addressed. I mean, you know, one of my favorites is the um, the Ryan Lochte um, piece. Is that in the... Is this you? No, I think Sarah is... Um, has Sarah jumped in for us? Sarah has oh. jumped in for us. <laughs> Hi, Sarah. Okay, I appreciate it because this is really difficult for us. Okay, so you can stop there. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, yeah, this is um, Olympic Threat. Um, this was uh, 2016, you know, the, the Ryan Lochte scandal. Um, they went to, to Rio. Um, I think they got drunk, hung out all night, mm -hmm. lost some money, damaged some property, peed on some walls. Mm -hmm. um, and then when it came out in the news, um, there was Usain Bolt. Um, I think most people prefer this one because it feels like a straight up lie. It feels like the Times is lying, like, oh, they lied. But <laughs> technically, um, the layout does clarify on some level <laughs> that this is a different article. It's just um, the the quick view of your eyes, you know, right. it's crimin criminality. I think that this is part of the problem with news media is that they're more willing to place black people um, in the paper as criminals um, and less willing to do so with white folk. So the absence of Ryan Lochte's photo here wasn't a surprise to me. So if you go to the next slide, Sarah, um, you can see a bit more of what the before and after is. So this is actually the left side slide where it is marked up, changed title. Um, and then the, the next one, which is um, with Ryan Lochte on it. Um, and White American um, was in the headline in part because newspapers were really reluctant to name um, to name whiteness. And for the longest time, um, they use race in headlines um, for black criminals, probably 100% of the time, but never for never for whites. So it's a, it's kind of a strike back in a way. But I also wanted to get at this idea that Americanness and whiteness aren't, they don't, they're not, they're not the same. <laughs> you don't automatically have one, you know, so it was, it was a goal to add a hyphen. Um, and to identify racially. Um, yeah, but yeah, the, those works are about whiteness as we get further along in the series. I think if you go one more, Sarah, I, I just don't wanna get stuck. Okay, I don't wanna get stuck too much on these. Um, I, so mean, I mean, part of what I'm, I'm, you know, I think is just important to hold on to, right? Is that, you know, like taken together, your work really alerts us to the ways in which whiteness and blackness are ways of seeing right, and ways of processing information. Um, and that we're already in a, you know, I mean, all of the things, right, that whiteness is authority and innocence and blackness is, you know, always criminality, always, you know, always you know, threatening or under threat. Um, and I think like the work in highlighting that, um, your work really, you know, obviously like brings that to the fore, um, but then, you know, sort of back to this question of what work does the work do and for whom, mm -hmm. right? How, how do you, like, what does it then mean to really intervene in, you know, this sort of, and I think what I also love talking about you to, about your work is that we're seeing the kind of process in your thinking, right? Mm -hmm. And the kinds of, the different kinds of tactics or strategies um, practices that you're taking. I mean, I know you wanted to go back to this last piece, but I wanted to also try and shift to the the Central Park um, series because I think that that really, you know, um, it, it's really a way of sort of getting us to again to kind of think about like, um, you know, what what we can't see, what we shouldn't see, mm -hmm. um, and how to how to kind of make um, you know these sort of structures more legible. Did you 
jump to slide 50. Well, I, I don't want to go to slide 50. I don't know if you want to go to slide 50 or if you wanted to stick with slide 32. I, I'm just I'm making up numbers. I um, I mean, if you want to jump to, to, to Central Park, we can. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I think, you know, I when know I, it's when hard I, for you. Hmm? I know, and I know this work is really, was, you know, was really difficult, is really difficult. Yeah, it was, really draining. it was a really draining experience. I think, um, and I have, you know, and I think we've talked about this before, questions about the utility of the work and like, when should you put um, black trauma before people and what it means to kind of grapple with some of these harms openly. And so I was, you know, I fall both ways. You know, I'm very much interested in going back in the archive and marking. And part of what I appreciate or wanted to do with this is that I thought I was doing some kind of service by bearing witness to what it occurred and what the Daily News did in terms of their reporting around the Central Park Five. Um, and so I spent quite a bit of time reading probably through about 40 pages worth of articles. Um, might have been more than that, but. I, 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 the series covers, um, you know, Trisha, Trisha Miley, the investment banker who was, who was raped um, and beaten was, um, it happened on April, I think the evening of April 19th. Um, mm -hmm. First day of reporting was Friday, April 21st, 1989, right? And so what we're looking at now, Wolfpack's Prey was the, the Daily News came out swinging, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. um, and so um, I wanted to, to start there and then work my way to the Trump ad. Um, mm -hmm. Trump, we all know it's a controversial figure. And he and I, and I never got out of here myself saying Trump and I, um, I don't exactly disagree with all his views of the media because I think that he more than anybody has been able to utilize it in a way. So he knows that they're dishonest, right? And so we go from you know, April 21st, 1989 to Monday, May 9th, 1989, which is the day, Monday, May 1st, I'm sorry, that um, the ad for the death penalty was placed in the paper, um, which is kind of a few slides in. But um, what I was trying to do, can you stop right there, Sarah? Um, so this is a photo litho and screen print. Um, what I really wanted to do was reconsider um, who the victims of this, this story was, right? And so a lot of the redactions here are about kind of turning down the noise a little. And I kind of hate to, to use that phrasing um, to think about Trisha Miley, but I think that what I found with this, even blacking out a number of the articles that were about her or, or ads or other kind of, you know, like distracting things is that people were still heavily invested in what happened to this white woman, even knowing that these young boys had been pretty much kind of framed in the media. Mm -hmm. um, it's very difficult to shift people's gaze, even when you put black boxes over things, right? You know, mm -hmm. in the Whitney, I could see people squatting and trying to get around reading the highlights, trying to see underneath. Um, if you go one more, Sarah, and a lot of what's there is like largely untrue, right? Um, she put up a terrific fight. I think that it really was reported that she fought, but once she was able to speak, I think it was, you know, and the real killer came forward. He said she was out as soon as he hit her. So there was no fighting, right? Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of this is, is, is dishonest. Um, but I, I, I blacked out a lot of things. I really wanted to get at the language. I was trying to think through Sylvia Winter's um, um, no humans involved in the first part of that was very much about categorization and language and how if we can apply particular terms to people we can we didn't have permission to treat them a certain way and so a lot of the phrasing um, used by the daily news was about about animal animalistic uh, mm -hmm. phraseology um, so Sarah if you go for one more this is kind of what this looks like after the fact except that at an angle you can actually still see the trees you can still see the cop you can still see the um, the, the larger text still still comes through. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you know you talk about people wanting to look around because on one hand, you know your earlier work gives us a before and after, right? Mm -hmm. So it is this kind of um, 
you know, in a little bit of an invitation into 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 the practice, right? Um, and showing the work. And in this in in this series, and no humans involved, it's very much you know, it's like actually we don't need to see any of this, right? <laughs> it's like we need to refuse exactly. Um, you know, it, it's all it's all redacted. Um, but I think there's also something in the in the process in your printing process that um, allows for the the residue, the trace of what's underneath to be um, to be visible, right? Or I, I don't even say visible, but to um, um, you know, we can we can get at right that residue a little bit. And you know, and I'm, I'm, and I know you spent a lot of time trying to kind of like working with your team at the printers, trying to think through, you know, exactly the the colors, the 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 level of um, of ink. And so, you know, can you just talk a little bit about about um, that? I that think process? you know we're having a lot of discussions about opacity and like what mm -hmm. what remains visible and what. Um, and the difference between excluding something and obscuring, right? And so I, I landed on this idea that I didn't want to um, eliminate Trisha Miley from the story. I just wanted her to be moved away from the center in a way, right? And so some of that was very much about trying to find a black that that gave that had light to it. So um, Sarah, if you go back a couple of slides, <laughs> yep, I was just going. Thanks. That's the one. This one where you can see the shadows. This is pretty much. I mean, it's, it's a once it's, it's glass and it's upright. It's not as, as easy to see. Um, but a lot of this was trying to. We were playing a lot with darkness and transparencies, right? And so, mm -hmm. um, um, I used um, photolitho plates, and so I was able to obtain these uh, really high res scans of the Daily News. Paper. I asked, at first, I was in the I was in the library pulling up microfiche like I was Julia Roberts in a '90s movie. I thought it was sexy. <laughs> um, and I was like, okay, this isn't really fruitful. This is really time consuming, and this is horrible. Like fantasy, fantasy over, but like you know, nice. <laughs> um, but when I was able to obtain those, um, it's really interesting because whoever scanned them, you know, sometimes you scan, you can actually see through the page, right? So some of the page from the back was coming through. There were a lot of like really interesting details to it. Um, but what it allowed me to do was to reproduce a probably similar size. I think each of the prints were about 11 by 14. Um, and then there was just the painstaking task of um, reading. So I took, you know, I overlaid it with maybe like a clear piece of mylar um, and used kind of an OVM that, that black box is kind of a darkened paper that we put. So when we photographed it, that it would actually kind of create that screen. Um, and the same thing for the highlights, but the highlights were actually me writing directly onto the film. Okay. Um, I blacked out the area that I wanted to be yellow. Um, and some of that was just kind of, you know, it, it, there was so much in the creation of the work that some aspects of it just, I wanted to have to be kind of literal, right? I really wanted to highlight the work. Um, and so if you go forward, I think the, the, the hardest decision, um, go one more, one more, I'm sorry. Okay, here we go. Um, actually, Sarah, can you just one more? I think there's a close up image, okay. Um, the, the hardest decision was to try to figure out what to do with the boys that appeared. Um, and so this is where the care part comes. But I also think this is, I think Sharp talks about this as well, right? You can't rescue people from what has, ha what has happened to them. Um, and so that instinct early on was like, oh, I'll just black out all of this stuff. But it's like, this has occurred, right? There's nothing that I can do to pretend that this didn't happen with how I present this work. And so the goal at that point was how do I share this story and show what the Daily News did and reduce some of the harm? Right. And so the decision that I made, because it was actually journalism, they didn't show young um, suspects. Right. And so the paper had, you know, 14 to 16 year olds in the paper, full, full, you know, front page. Um, and so I made a decision to pixelate them. But there wasn't it was after um, considering other things. At some point I had cut them out, but then they created this very weird oblong shape. And I wanted to be very careful that 
if I left an empty space, it didn't seem like I was asking people to imagine themselves in their shoes, right? I was really concerned mm -hmm. it would be this like, in the space of them missing, what if this happened to you, right? Mm -hmm. And there's like, I've seen work like that, I really hate it. I think, um, you know, you and I talk a bit about Hartman and, and empathy and what she says. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think, that we can insert ourselves into someone's as a narrative that way. So I wanted to be really cautious about trying to make them this vessel mm -hmm. for feeling. Um, what's the, I mean, we talked about this. I think we should maybe, you know, in, in scenes, scenes of subjection, um, there's um, the guy Rankin, right? He's an abolitionist. Is this what? Mm -hmm. that and he's trying to imagine that he, um, what it would be like if he were a slave, I think, is that what he's doing? Right, right. It, you know, so setting up this 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 framework that, well, empathy, right, is to, to kind of be in, some, imagine oneself or be in someone else's skin and the skin of the other in order to kind of, you know, understand and feel feel as them, right, and feel their experience. And, you know, and we, we call for, I think often in, in you know, these last few years, right? We call for empathy and calls for, you know, to kind of understand the plight of, you know, whatever other side, <laughs> supposedly. Um, mm -hmm. But I think what's, you know, what Hartman offers us is to say, um, well, there's a way in which empathy means that we actually end up displacing the experience um, or just dis displacing uh, people from the center of their own lives, right? And their own experiences. Um, and so, right, so then what, how do we open up um, a kind of visual practice or artistic practice um, or really like living practice in which we can, um, you know, appreciate value um, you know, re and redress people's um, experiences of violence and trauma, um, but not try to erase it, um, mm -hmm. or displace it. And I think, you know, and I, I think this is part of like why I'm, I'm, I've been asking you to kind of walk us through the development of your work because you know, you're showing us that you're showing us these different modes of trying to um, to kind of answer that question. Um, and I mean, if we go back to the slide um, of the the wolf pack that's sort of um, laying on the right, um, you know, I think this question also of opacity um, and of you know, and I'm hoping people that people can see the kinds of traces of the trees which you know, to me is a, a reminiscent of, um, you know, of lynching photographs, um, right, of that, that kind of history, um, the darkness, but it also suggests to us um, a kind of power and faith in what we, what we can't see, right, um, which is a real intervention mm -hmm. in the structure of the news media, right, the idea that, like, News is, is, you know, is all about the facts, everything that we, you know, that all the news that's fit to print, right? Everything that has been cited that we can see, that we can photograph, um, you know, that you can, <laughs> you can find like Julia Roberts in the Pelican Brief, <laughs> like living there. I'm that I'm that will always be, will be a forever image of you, Alex. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, but this, you know, what does it mean then to kind of have, um, to take a certain kind of faith or, um, or to glean knowledge in um, what we can't see? And I say that because so much of the construction of Black life under Western kind of Western epistemology, Western ways of knowing and seeing really have been about producing race as a visualizable fact, right? Producing black life as something that is seeable, knowable, containable, categorizable, um, dismissible mm -hmm. in so many ways. Um, and here in this work, um, you know, is, is the cover of the daily news 
um, in a way that like suddenly we have no access yeah. and the importance of not having access in a certain kind of way. Yeah, I the lynching, the lynching, um, I mean, I know the trees offer that, right? This mm -hmm. forest, this dense kind of forest. I think we talked about this in relation to maybe um, Dawood's work. Um, I think the entire series, as it's from beginning to end, one could consider it like a lynching photograph mm -hmm. itself, right? If you think about the way um, lynchings were talked about and proliferated in the media and they and how they took the shape of these Witch, witch hunts over days, right? Mm -hmm. um, it has the same kind of, um, it's the same kind of act. Um, mm -hmm. It's not something that I was thinking about when I was working on it, but I think when I look at it in total, um, Sarah, if you skip to the, if you skip past um, where you can see the installation of the work, it's not a, it's not a super easy photo to see for the, for the public, because it's just, oh, go back. Mm -hmm. it's 20 frames, right? But if we start at this kind of wolf pack's prey, and then we have Trump's ad kind of bookending it, right? We have this kind of ultimate act of the of the paper kind of providing this kind of de definition and conferring a particular about like a viewpoint on these boys, and then we get to the end um, where we have them kind of colluding um, with this popular figure to 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 place this ad. And so I think that it kind of culminates. I mean, what's interesting about it is. Some people actually didn't know about the Central Park Five. So the way that it was laid out in the Whitney, and I can't remember if we discussed this as an approach, but you read through the entire work and then you get to the final um, wall text and it tells you they were innocent, right? And there's like people mad, like going crazy, like, oh my God, I just read all this. I believed everything that I read. Um, and it's interesting. It's interesting to see people not really question the verbiage, right? Not to question the language, um, mm -hmm. to kind of think that they're reading something that is reality and then to get to the end and go, oh shit, you know, they were innocent. And maybe I need to go back and read that again and reconsider because mm -hmm. some of the, the, the language isn't overtly racist. It's the way that it's used, right? So there are certain pages where they talk about, you know, thumb sucking and certain behaviors that are just how people exist, but they've been defined and put forward in these ways that suggest something else. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I think I wanted to get back to this point about Vessel, because we do, we did kind of think about this talk in relation to other work too, mm -hmm. how um, Blackness or whiteness um, or empathy shows up in other works. And when you were talking about um, this Vessel, I was thinking about, um, Adrian Piper's work on Trayvon Martin. Hmm. Work? No, I, I want to. I'm assuming it's in the slideshow. It's in the slideshow. Okay. Um, Sarah, where are you? It's slide 45. Um, she can pull that up for us. Oh, so it was at her retrospective, which I believe was at MoMA. Mm -hmm. um, she had these takeaways, right? It's. Um, can you see that? Mm -hmm. Imagine what mm -hmm. it was like to be me. I I really I really loathed this work. <laughs> I really hated this work. Um, and so you know when we talk, we just spend a lot of time talking about care. And I you know I I wouldn't necessarily make the claim that all my work does that, but I I do try not to do this kind of iteration, right? Where we kind of utilize a black life to try to force a particular kind of feeling or empathy um, from the viewer, um, which seems in some ways really egregious, but the, the function of this work too is that it was a series of takeaways. Like, you know, just like um, in, a, in the vein of like Alfredo Jar, or, you know, or Felix Gonzalez Torres, you could take, you could actually take um, paper with you. I, I really hate that I'm breaking you in on this, on this work. <laughs> yeah, no, well, you know, I mean, I, I guess I'm also, I situate it, I, you know, seeing this, situating it in the longer, you know, the longer arc of Adrian Piper's work that was often about kind of, um, you know, the kind of um, sort of mutability of her, of her own mixed race body, right? And disrupting these ideas of what people thought they knew about 
who she was she was right as a as a you know a woman or as a man or um and you know and so i sort of i see the way that the work kind of um is an extension of that practice um while at the same time um you know it i it, it is jarring and discomforting in a way that i don't know um you know, feels right. And, but I think, you know, partly also for me, I really do question because we're in a moment where we all have so much access to these images, right. Of, um, you know, the, the, the you know, the, the pre-mortem <laughs> photographs, right. The, or the living photographs of all of the, the people you know, whose names we now say, right? Mm -hmm. That I don't know that there's, there also seems something a little bit reckless and careless in the repetition of those images in this moment, right? As opposed to um, trying to present, um, you know, present the quote, like, you know, them, these folks living, right? In their living. Um, or I think for me, um, I think increasingly, I don't feel like I need to see images of black folks who were, who've been murdered by the state to, um, you know, to value their lives, right? I think the harder work for me right now is then how to actually challenge the structures that make that make such um, such trauma, such, such actions possible, right? So really it's the question for me of like, how to address the question of, of um, you know, of white supremacy and white violence, right? Um, and I think you, you put pulled up, um, you know, Carrie James Marshall's heirlooms and accessories triptych, which is, um, you know, I think really just, uh, you know, I don't want to say underrated because it's like, I, I can't imagine anything about Carrie Dims Marshall, right? Underrated, but like, it's a really powerful work that takes the, um, I believe it's the 1930 image of the lynching of um, Thomas Ship and Abram Smith in Marion, Indiana, um, and, you know, literally wipes out, um, you know, the, the, the victims, the black male victims, hanging in the tree, and isolates the um, the white women in the crowd, mm -hmm. um, and you know, creating these image, um, you know, these images of, of jewelry around them, right? So that these become they are both accessories to murder, right? Mm -hmm. um, but also these kinds of um, these heirloom jewels that get passed down from. Yeah to generation um, and I think it is a really powerful and effective work that does that kind of simultaneously affects care for that history while also right calling attention to um, you know to to white participation which like in that kind of other framing of whiteness whiteness often gets to go invisible invisibilized and unmarked yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think um, there, there are part of what I think is really problematic about the Adrian Piper work and something that I've tried to avoid is um, this kind of trading up a black life to make a point to whiteness. And I think um, you talked about this a bit in your piece where you, I think you quoted something from, it might've been Siddhartha, um, where you said, without attending to the value of Black life. I think you were talking about the Dana Schutz piece, right? When it comes mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. of certain works existing, is that mm -hmm. they are trying to do something without caring for the subject that they're using. Um, mm -hmm. So that is what strikes me as odd with the, um, with the Adrian Piper work. Um, and I think we talked similarly maybe about the there's a Gordon, the Gordon work. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's like two or three slides back. Gordon and Hulk Hogan. Mm -hmm. Is that, is this the Hulk? Yeah. The Hulk, sorry, mm -hmm. not Hulk Hogan. 
than the Hulk. The Hulk. <laughs> the Hulk. The Hulk. Um, and this, I think we talked about context, right? Yeah. So a lot about work in context and like where something um, has a different meaning depending on where it is. And so I get asked this a lot about the Michael Brown work um, because the location of the work does matter, but the work actually exists on its own, right? So mm-hmm. I, have, I have questions about how much a work might rely on context. Mm-hmm. Um, perform what it needs to do. And if it can't do it in its own, then I have concerns about it existing as a work. Um, your read of this, you, this is your slide, I think. Can you talk about yeah, it? Sure. So this is um, Arthur Jaffa. This is an installation of Arthur Jaffa's exhibition. I'm forgetting the name of it, but um, in, um, in a gallery in Berlin, um, I saw this uh, a few years ago. Um, and we kind of were really, Alex and I were talking about this because on the, um, on the right side is, um, a kind of three-dimensional reproduction of the image of Gordon who had been enslaved and, and his whip scarred back became a kind of abolitionist, um, you know, an abolitionist trope, it, it circulated for abolitionist purposes um, around, um, thank you, this this show is, is called a series um, of utterly improbable <laughs> yet extraordinary renditions. Um, and- there? Huh? Okay, no, I, get it. I know, I, I phone a friend. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you. I'm listening well, Um, But sort of, you know, so it circulated, right, as this really important abolitionist um, kind of text, right? And again, this is about like, you know, we can, we believe the horrors of, of, of slavery or the traumas of Black life by seeing them, right? And what can be seen. Um, And, you know, so Alex and I were talking about this, about how um, the, the challenge of this piece as, is it, um, you know, is it reproducing? I mean, it is literally reproducing black pain, right? Um, and to what effect? And you know, and for me, I found there's a whole story for me in the conversation between um, the reproduction of the Hulk, Hulk, Hulk smashing, right? Um, and Gordon, and the ways in which um, black folks, black skin is often understood as kind of like impervious to pain right um and black people are you know, are seen as as um you know less susceptible to pain and so this kind of um the extraordinariness right of these two figures um as in many ways is both kind of figments of white imagination um and so that for me was like the conversation but it is one that is fundamentally about context, right? It's about curation. It's about the work of the curator. Um, I get all you curators, because mm-hmm. I, I don't know about that read, right? So um, I think, and I feel like this came up in response to, you know, when I was talking to you about what happened with Tulsa Hate Crime, which is a work that I suspended and decided not to make anymore because um, of the death of the individual in the work and that fact that I couldn't make the point that I wanted to make about whiteness without kind of playing on, on the death of the, of the main subject of the, of the work. Um, well, the subject of the work was a white guy, but I couldn't actually make the point about whiteness without reproducing this particular kind of harm. And that became really clear to me as I kept installing the work, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and actually moving with the word. So I think I approach works like this from the standpoint of a maker, right? And so what needs to go into actually creating something like this is where my mind goes. Mm -hmm. I think that, and I, you know, I've seen this work up close with AJ in my presence and I've never really commented on it. So it's probably not the best place for me to (laughs) sort through my thinking about it, but it keeps coming up for me in the past couple of weeks. Um, And I think that when I look at Gordon and I see keloids and scarring, you know, mm-hmm. a keloid is like a hyper healing of a wound that extends usually beyond away from the body. Um, that's tight, 
that's actually an active scar in a lot of ways, right? The friends that I know who have keloids who actually have to get them kind of surgically um, reduced mm -hmm. as they grow, um, is that they itch, sometimes they sting, like they're they're actually alive in a way. And if mm -hmm. depending on how how they formed on your body, they're actually can they can actually restrict, restrict movement. So the idea of someone kind of creating a work that then displaces the skin more, right? To make a mold, to make a 3D embodiment is, is odd to me as a as a gesture, as an artistic gesture, right? I have to wonder kind of what the point of that becomes. And this work is a single singular work. So my thinking of it is if curatorially this works, this work doesn't survive on its own. If, if you need a work to be, to always be, not to say, you know, to mm -hmm. always be in conversation with another work to get at the point, then that work, then it's not a work by itself, right? Then this work should travel with hope. It should go with that. Um, I, but I just think, you know, extending the skin further, I think the installation of actually putting, hanging him on the wall, mm -hmm. like things to me feel like they, there's a harm there happening. Mm -hmm. that I don't think that we can get away with, with the, like, you know, a more like sexy curatorial understanding of the interplay between these two. Um, well, you know, I mean, I appreciate that. And I mean, I think the two things I would want to say um, well, first, yes, I think like this is a huge break. Right, can can the work stand on its own? Um, you know, secondly, I do really want to make um, a, a, an important like you know place pressure on the role of the curator, right? Um, at the curator, the you know the you know the newspaper editor, the newspaper and magazine editor, um, the educational staff in a museum, myself as a teacher, right? Like, because I think in many ways, images, artwork, they don't live on their own, right? Yeah. They never live on their own. They're always traveling. They're always taking on accumulating new meaning in whatever context they're placed in. And so, you know, and I think fundamentally kind of what we're seeing in this moment or, or what, what the conversation about care is about is um, all of the work, all of the responsibility beyond the artist, right? Um, that the rest of us have to take on in actually providing a living context, um, you know, for for the for for these histories, these works, and these ideas, right? Um, and so I think, um, you know, and I do go back to at the root work, the root of a root word of, of curator is care, right? Um, so like, so what what is the care that's embedded in that process? Um, and then I guess, secondly, I would just say, um, I think what I'm also realizing is that um, I am always amazed by how much work images often do um, in places that I don't expect, right? And, um, you know, and it, it, you know, and so thinking about like, you know, what that Adrian Piper work may have actually done for people. Oh, sorry, I look all, um, there we go. Um, but, you know, or thinking about, um, you know, even for my students, when I teach who are, in, who may encounter um, images of, of Gordon for the first time, um, or images of lynchings for the first time. And it, it does a certain kind, um, you know, of work. And so like not to be, <laughs> again, I, I don't want to be the wake work police. Um, and I also don't want to be the woke police. Um, but I think that there are, you know, um, that there are, that in many ways, these images can do different kinds of work for different people in different moments. Yeah. Maybe that's me being very oh, I hear you. Yeah. Um Alex, do you wanna um have the last word before we we take um a question? I mean I see a question here. I don't know if it still remains. Sophia wants to know if I can speak more about the process and at what point do I decide to intervene on a piece of media? I Maybe that was a long time ago she asked. <laughs> um, 
You know, I think some of the decision goes to, I mean, I think this is a great question actually, because there are a lot of works that I have that are incomplete. So I have a lot that I'm, so there's a combination of factors. Some of it is like, if there's a lesson to impart, if there's a, if there's an aesthetic, you know, thing that I can get at, you know, I find articles all the time that there's one word or two words that maybe I can shift, but what does that look like artistically to try to communicate? And so I don't deal with those. Um, work where there's like an egregious amount of violence in the first, so on the left panel or whatever would be, I don't work with those. So that's another decision. Um, so a lot of times it's a process of elimination. Um, I've kind of backed away from counter narratives at this moment, if that's what you're, you're talking about. Um, and I'm thinking, and this is, I think this goes to kind of where I think artists energy should go. So, you know, counter narratives is kind of morphed into this, conversation about whiteness, um, the Central Park Five in a way tries to, you know, to, you know, call out or redress kind of white media. And so I'm at the point now where with the work that I'm doing now, I'm looking more towards black media, I'm trying to think a lot about how um, black media emerged and what some of the work that is trying to take up, um, which is, which is interesting. It's not, it, and it doesn't mean that I'm trying to go somewhere where I can only think about what's good, right? So one of the quotes that, um, have you ever seen um, uh, Kathleen Collins' masterclass? So she's talking about, mm -mm. one of the things that she talks about is like how, um, if you've spent all of this time being um, seen as a sinner, that you think that your goal is then to present yourself as a saint. Um, and so what I'm finding a lot with black media is that the emergence of black media, they did do that to some degree yeah. um, to, the de to the detriment of some communities. So I'm looking back at old black newspapers and, and trying to get a sense of what their mission, their mission was at the time. Um, and even thinking about media from the, the 80s. Um, so, you know, Kathy Cohen's um, Boundaries of Blackness deals a lot with um, Black leaders' response to the HIV um, epidemic. Um, and a lot of what she finds, especially even in reporting in newspapers, is that there's such a desire to continue or to present Blackness as, this, as the good of Blackness, um, mm -hmm. that there's an avoidance of actually real stories that impact um, certain members of the Black community. So I've, I'm spending a lot of time now um, doing that kind of work and research. Um, and then I'm also working on a newspaper that's set in the future. Um, I'm really, um, I spent, I've been thinking a lot about how mainstream news media is, um, is anti-movement. Mm -hmm. And I've been reading primarily about the welfare rights movement and really thinking a lot about how as the movement kind of, you know, gained ground, um, the media's portrayal of who was on welfare and who needed welfare and the story behind poverty shifted, right? Because early, I think, in reporting, um, it was very much thought of as that, you know, people who were poor or people who needed support um, were just kind of in unfortunate circumstance. It was a, a much kinder portrayal. And as we kind of push through, which I see the welfare rights movement is probably a, a inner, uh, black inner, um, feminist movements in a way, um, the reporting shifts, right? There's a, there's a shift in, in media that starts to look really at um, Black women as moochers, as lazy. Um, and so I've been, that's where I've been stuck. I don't, um, thinking through those things. So it's less now about um, getting at these like individual articles and looking at these time periods and, and frameworks and thinking about mm -hmm. Um, and that's a whole truth fact thing <laughs> that I'm trying to trying to trying to grapple with. Is this uh, kind of idea that you can present a number of like, and if we think of fact as this kind of quantifiable thing that I can go and I can say, oh, there were three people in the house. There are three people in the house. Um, what does it mean to um, grapple with over time the accumulation of facts being used in a way to present something in a way that's not truthful? And so that's where I am now. And I, and I think that's as much about trying to think really critically about the articles that were produced in that time, but then something that's not even about 
um, news media per se, which is me really trying to pin down narrative formation, memory, mm -hmm. when you communicate certain information. So that's that's where the work is spinning out to at this moment. Um, so yeah, sometimes there, sometimes these. Um, I'll start at a point and it just spins out to something else. I think, so I have a billboard that's like facts don't equal truths. And I think you kind of told me, it was like, this is really basic. Um, I didn't tell you it was basic. What did you tell me? You said, you were like, what'd you say? One hand? <laughs> um, I, said, I said it was like a Zen koan, the sound of one hand clapping. And I needed a little help <laughs> to walk through it. I mean, I, I think we've been getting, I, I think we're getting, I mean, but we have been like kind of circling around that, right? Like circling all of the ways in which, you know, these kind of pieces of information can be disaggregated or aggregated in such a way to perform a certain kind of work that is not necessarily, um, that is harmful and that is not necessarily a, a mode of truth. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, so it doesn't actually get at a kind of like bigger picture um, you know, heart like kind of question. Um, but yeah, no, I just, um, part of it is just, Alex, part of it is, is, is that I'm, I'm just old and I need I didn't take offense to it. Take offense to it. it actually is a very simple, um, it's a simple, I guess, equation, non equation. It's just the start of a series of thoughts and conversations that I've been having around what actually is a fact, right? Mm -hmm. And trying to, um, think about how our reliance on that um, lends itself towards a particular kind of kind of just narrative formation. I'm, it's it's part of a long, larger project to try to work to get with that word. But I was just like, you know what? Let me just put this really simplified thing out, and then I'm gonna work my way out of that. Um, or, you know, I think the other thing it, that I'm learning is that is actually trying to work my way into it, right? Yeah, I think that might, be, that, might actually be, that might actually be a better way of putting it. So someone asked, I'm um, curious about whether the shift in narrative about people and welfare was led by the Reagan administrations. Where, where are you? <laughs> I'm so bad. Where are you seeing the, that ah, there they are. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. So the Reagan administration's, Reagan's welfare queen thing came in like 76, I think, right? So we're, when we start to think about the, the collapse of the welfare rights movement to some degree, I think we're late 60s, early 70s. So it was part of a larger system um, that reframed how, how people thought about welfare, but it, was, it, it wasn't the only thing. I mean, at, at that time, where the, where the Moynihan report is out, um, there's a there's an onslaught of things reframing how we think about um, welfare and and black families. So it's the, the Reagan thing is one 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 aspect of that. It's not the whole of it, but that didn't help. Um, yeah, I was wondering if there are any more questions over here before we kind of wrap it up. Oh, okay. Um, oh, um, Moody at Rice University has a work up, I think, for another week or so. I think, um, yeah, that's the other place. I, I don't know what's, what's open now, given COVID, but those are the only places right now. Um, but, you know, your website is also a good place. Yeah, that's not up to date. Yeah. I'll work on that. <laughs> um, you know, and then I think also like going back, well, you, you know, your website is also a good place to start to go back to previous exhibitions, yeah. um, you know, and thinking about the work in the, in the Whitney um, and looking at the Whitney site. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, well. I mean, the, the, the work is, I think for the, the best way to see the Central Park Five work is you can go to um, the Whitney's page, I think, or Harvard has it in the collection section and you can look at it page by page. So that's an easy, that's an easy way to view it. I think mm -hmm. that's the best way to maybe look at the work anyway. Um, you can't actually see it in person. Um, but yeah, I don't, I'm wondering if there's anything else that we meant to cover that we didn't. I got the facts and the truth thing in there. I mean, there's always so many things, but I think this is a good place to end for now. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you so much, Alex. 
Thanks yeah. for inviting me to be in conversation with you. I'll text with you after this. <laughs> so I'm definitely not getting in any more of these video things. <laughs> no, no I, that's not true. We're gonna get you on dating, huh? Oh, Sarah. Uh, oh, I thought Sarah. Thing. Okay. Okay. <laughs> here I am. I want to thank you, Alex and Lee, for being part for being here tonight. And I want to thank everyone at home for being joining us for this conversation. We'll be back on Wednesday, December 16th, with Nan Golden Golden and Tanya Bergera on art and activism. Thank you for tuning in tonight and have a wonderful evening.